here. And uh, we just love everybody so much and I'm so appreciative for uh, just each person that's out here. And uh, we pray that today you'll just do a good work through our service, uh, through the music, through the message. Uh, we know, um, Lord, the series on the family has been special. We know that Satan would want nothing more than to tear down the homes and the families of good Christians. Uh, but we're grateful that we have a church and that we have a pastor uh, that can teach the truth and teach us how to safeguard against that in our homes. So we pray that we model Christ in our lives and in our families. We pray that you'll just bless in everything today. We love you, Lord, and thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I just want to start with a few announcements here. Uh, as always, if you have your offering with you in person today, we've got our gray gift boxes. They are located by the doors at the exits uh, inside of the uh, Connections building there. Also, we've got boxes behind me in the hallways. Uh, so when you see a box, you can just drop your offering in there, and we'll take care of it for you. If you're joining us online, you can go to crbible.com slash give. You'll be able to give your offering there as well. And I just want to direct your attention to your handout if you got that today. Uh, down at the very bottom of the handout, we have a, uh, uh, we've got a little need for some workers in the children's ministry. Uh, so you can look that over if you have a heart of, uh, to work with children. Uh, I know that it takes a special temperament to do that sometimes. But if you're uh, interested in working with kids, we could really use some help. So uh, look that over. We've got several areas there. A little checkbox you can select of whichever area you're interested in uh, working in. Fill that out and then you can slide that inside of the gift boxes as well. Uh, on your way out the door today, and then somebody from the church will contact you this week about getting you plugged in and a time and a day to serve there. And we would definitely appreciate the help. Uh, and then also what we want to do this morning is we want to welcome any visitors that we might have. Uh, we're so glad to always have guests here at Crossroads. So if it's your very first time, we want you to know how glad we are you chose to be with us. Uh, if you are, you might have already stopped off at our welcome desk in the very front and received a little purple gift bag filled with some goodies. But if you didn't, we want to make sure that you do that today. So if it's your first time, stop off at that desk on your way out today. Tell them that you're a first-time visitor, and they're just going to give you a little purple bag. It's filled with some goodies there. You can take those home. The only thing we need back from you is a card that you're going to see on the outside of the bag. If you could fill that card out and then just leave it right there at the desk with the workers, or again, you can just put it inside of one of those uh, gift boxes at the door, uh, then we'll take care of the card from there. And then if you're joining us online and it's your first time, just go to crbible.com forward slash FTG. That stands for First Time Guest. And we're going to have a gift we can give to you as well. And lastly, uh, if you are a first time guest, we have our hospitality room. It's located to my right behind those French doors in the back. Uh, so after the service, if you'd like to meet our pastor and shake his hand, just stop right off in there. He'll be in there with his wife, Miss Denise. And uh, you can stop in right after the service and they'll be happy to uh, to see you there. So church family, aren't you glad to have our visitors this morning? Psalm uh, 46 says that God is our refuge and strength, a well-proven help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. We're going to be uh, teaching y'all a new song today. And the, the chorus is that God is the refuge that we run to. We can depend on him. We can trust in him. And I love this song because it says that I'll follow you anywhere. And that, you know, so many songs, they they talk about God and, you know, God is great and, and God is good and we praise him. And that's, that is fantastic because that's what we're supposed to do. But I love songs that also kind of call for a response from us as individuals that say, God, because of who you are, here's what I'm going to do. And that's what this song says. It's, I'm going to follow you anywhere. So have you heard us sing with us? If not, learn it and sing it out. You are the refuge I run to. You are the fire that leads me through the night. I'll follow you anywhere. There's a million reasons to trust you. Nothing to fear for you. I'll follow you
God, thank you for loving us yes. so much that you sent your son Jesus to this earth to pray, pay the price for our sins. Amen. God, we're not worthy of that kind of love. Yes, Lord. But you've given to us anyways. Yes. God, we just want to lift you up this morning. We want to learn from you. So God, speak to us mm. as we pray, as we study your word. Everything we do, Lord, help us to become more like you. Yes. God, we give this time over to you. We give this service over to you. We ask your spirit to lead us and work in us today. We love you, God, and we pray all these things in your name. Yes. Amen. Hey. Amen. Amen. Are you excited to be here, church? Woo! Amen. Hey. We have Adam Lovey come up. You might not know, Adam is our young adult director here. Um, our young adult ministry is called The Gathering, and Adam's going to talk to you about the retreat that we have. Yeah, so this year, at the beginning of the year, here at Crossroads, as you guys know, we have a super big importance on Scripture and God's Word, and so we wanted to go through with the gathering, with our young adults, Scripture from beginning to end, hitting all the main stories and kind of calling it, I heart the Word, falling in love with every part of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation and how it's important to us, and so each year we like to take a retreat right before the fall semester to just refocus and unplug, go out into nature together, one big house, and just have a time of worship, studying scripture, conversations, questions, and just have a time to discuss. And so we wanted our theme this year to kind of complement I Heart the Word. And so as you guys know, this has been a crazy year. Every day is different. So we call our theme this year Scan Fur. So every day we wake up, we're like, what's going to happen? The one thing that we know for sure is God's word does not change hey. every day. We can stand firm on that truth. And so we had three different sessions while we were out there. The first one, we looked at kind of what is the Bible? Where does it come from? Historical evidence that supports it as truth and why we need a foundation, why we should build our foundation on that truth. And then our second session, we went into, okay, how do we stand firm on that truth? And it's the idea of unity. As the body of Christ, two are better than one. When we want to do something to stand firm, to, to live out God's word, do it together. In the last session, we had a, a challenge of, hey, we heard why this is important, how we do it. Now, we have the Holy Spirit on our side. We can go and we can stand firm when trials come and when hard times come. On God's truth. And the last thing we did before we left was we had a, a debrief session where we just talked together, asked each other questions, and really honed in on what we learned, what the main points were, and what we could do with that in our life as young adults. And so there's a video here from some of the young adults that went answering these debrief questions. So watch this. Before the retreat. Before the retreat. Before the retreat. Before the retreat. Feeling down, really negative. Stressful and emotional time. Uh, very stressed. With a lot of burdens on my shoulders. I almost felt like useless. Loneliness. Under a lot of pressure. Overworked and burnt out. I was going through a very hard time. I was just in a constant rotation of not getting anything done. During the retreat, I felt like there were a lot of areas that I should be giving over to God that I wasn't giving over to Him. And I felt like through my prayer, I was really beginning to be able to surrender those things. I felt like He was showing me that the reason why I feel the way that I do is because I'm not relying on my true foundation, on him. I'm relying on what everyone else was thinking and feeling about me instead of him. Somebody explained it as it wasn't a vacation, but it was more of like a spiritual rest. We were resting in Jesus. We were having full faith in him. There was no pressure from the outside world. I was you know, happy that I was surrounded with a bunch of people that could give me accountability. I could trust them to open up about my struggles. The sense of togetherness um, that we experienced provided a peace and a clarity that I really needed. I think one thing I, I definitely learned about myself is that I worry way too much about things that may not be that much of a problem. And one thing I definitely learned about God is that every time I felt lonely, He's always been right there even though I couldn't see it. I was really reminded of how crucial it is to just spend time with Jesus personally every day. God is always by our side no matter who we are, no matter 
where we are in our lives, and that we can always stand firm and we can. I tend to hold on to things that um, God has already forgiven me for, and that hinders my walk with Him. No matter what I've done in my past, I can stand firm on His promises. I just really had a, a, a peace and a, just a lack of stress as compared to what I was experiencing beforehand. Uh, ever since the retreat, now I feel like I've gotten a piece of myself back that I thought was gone forever. Been looking forward to the outlet for my passion for serving the Lord. One of the last things that Adam said in our little deep brief when we were about to leave was the only thing we have done differently this weekend is that we have been in the Word more than we usually are and we have talked to each other more about God and it has impacted us so greatly. It's that simple. Just continue on with this in your daily life. There's no reason why this has to end. I think in my life, since the retreat, I've just tried to make more of an effort to like bring Jesus with me in every conversation and in everything I do because it's like that simple to have like peace and joy in the Lord.
And so we see that, you know, God's design is that kids are to bring joy to their parents. And so many times they do. I mean, I was looking back recently at some of our family videos, you know, and I was looking back at those and I told Denise, I said, man, I miss those days when our kids were growing up that I would go back in a heartbeat to those days. I love those days. I told you a few weeks ago that, um, I, and I mean this, I truly embraced fatherhood. Um, I, I really enjoyed it thoroughly. I, I enjoyed every day pretty much. Not that there weren't hard times and bad days, but pretty much I just enjoyed and embraced fatherhood. I just really. That was her thing, man. I mean, she, she loved that. And, you know, I had a great example in my life. Uh, my dad was very active in my life. And, and my mother, still alive, she's probably watching right now. Uh, and mom was an incredible mother. Uh, she was just an amazing mom, still is. And my dad, I just say dad because I'm a dad, so I can kind of relate to that. My dad was very active in my life which is sometimes unusual. A lot of parent, a lot of kids don't have that. They don't have a dad who's active in their life, and I did. And uh, so I carried that over to my kids, you know? And every day, I loved fatherhood. I enjoyed going home from work and being able to play with the kids. And we were out in the street with all the neighborhood kids, and I was right in the middle of all the kids. And I was the, the pitcher if it was kickball or wiffle ball, the quarterback if we were playing football, we played basketball, we played games at night, we'd go to parks and we'd go have fun. And we just, we really, really had a good time. Uh, and, and it was just a joy of my life. And, you know, it's funny because now I see my son Clint doing that, you know, and Clint has two sons. And, and he spends time with them, and it just thrills my heart to see that, you know, that, that he's carrying that on, and he's embraced fatherhood. You know, the, the other side of the coin, though, of this, about kids bringing joy, the other side of the coin of that is found in Proverbs 10. Go back to chapter All right, Proverbs 10 and verse number 1. It says here, the Proverbs of Solomon, a wise son makes a glad father. Look at this. But a foolish son is the what? The grief or heaviness. Yeah, if you've got the old King James, it says heaviness. But that word heaviness means grief. And it says the, a foolish son is the grief of his mother. And that word there, grief or heaviness... It means depression of spirit. And so your kids can really get you down. Your kids can depress you. He says they can bring grief to you. Uh, in fact, Proverbs 19.26 takes it to a whole other level. And in Proverbs 19.26, it teaches that kids can even bring shame and reproach to their parents. Now, no parents expect that. No parents plan on that when they're holding that little baby in their arms. And really, when you get right down to it, we really ultimately have no control over that. So we do the best we can, and our children are then responsible to God for their own actions once they become adults. There are no perfect parents. They just don't exist, okay? There are no perfect parents. We're all flawed. So, you know what? I mean, it's like nobody has these perfect parents who are the who has this leave-it-to-beaver world that you live in where mom and dad always do the right thing and make the right call and make the right decision every single time. No kid has parents like that. There are no perfect parents, by the way, just like there's no perfect kids. Okay? So let's just get that straight, too. I look back on complete fondness with my parents. Were they perfect? No. But I really look back fondly on my parents because I know they tried really hard to be good parents. And 
I know I brought a lot of grief to them, you know, and I, I, I brought a lot more grief to them than they did to me. And let me tell you, you say, Pastor Dan, really? <laughs> did you know I wasn't always Pastor Dan? <laughs> did you know when I came out of the womb, they didn't say, let's name him Pastor Dan. <laughs> it, growing up, my teachers and my parents, probably a nickname would have been, instead of Pastor Dan, Demon Dan. Uh, <laughs> Because I was very, very, uh, like I said, I brought a lot more grief to them than they ever brought in my life, okay? Uh, so, you know, they're, they're, listen, parents, there's no perfect parents. They just don't exist. There are no foolproof plans that are going to guarantee your kids are going to turn out the way you want them to turn out. They're just, I'm not going to give you a perfect plan here, okay? Um, in fact... A verse that caught my attention years ago, it's like, wow. It was kind of like, man. It's one of those verses where it's like, wow. It's, it's right at the beginning of the book of Isaiah, and he's like, hear, O heavens, and hear, O earth. It's like, whoa. You know, and then here's what God says. Let's bring it up on the screen. Here's what God I have nourished and brought up children, God said, and they have what? <laughs> Rebelled against me. It's like, wow, he's the perfect father. Right? He's like frustrated. Because he said, I brought up kids and they rebelled against me. So what do we do as parents? Well, we provide to the best of our ability what God says our kids need. Not always what they want, but what the Bible says they need. And here in the book of Proverbs, God shows us what children need. So we do the best we can with God's help to provide the things here. And thankfully, the things God says the kids need is not name brand clothes, a fancy house, a new car when they turn 16, or a fully funded college education. Because you know what? If that was the requirements, we couldn't all do that. It wouldn't be fair. Amen? Um, that's, those things are great if you can do those things as a parent, but that, that is not really what the Bible says kids need. Okay? With God's help and with God's grace... We can provide for our kids what we read in the Bible. It's, it's kind of an even playing field. In other words, what God says kids need, every one of us that are parents can do these things that I'm going to give you. So let's look at them. Number one is this. The Bible says, number one, and, and I'm going to encourage you in this. If you don't have kids, don't tune me out. Because number one, you might have kids one day. Some of you are like, no, I'm never having kids again. All right. If you're here, you might have kids. If you've already had your kids, this might be some, something that you might be able to share with someone else, like your child who's raising up kids now. But So I, I want everybody to really grab this. The other thing, too, that I think is that the three things I want to talk about that kids need, some of this you may not have got growing up. And that could explain why you struggle in certain areas of your life. So this, if you actually come with an open mind and heart to listen – God might just reveal some things to you about yourself. It's like, wow, okay, I didn't get that growing up. And I think that's why I struggle in this era that area. Well, once you identify it, now you're able to kind of help, and you're able to get God's help, and you're able to maybe fix some things that you need to in your life if you realize that was lacking in my life. You know. So let's look at it. Number one is this. Number one, the Bible teaches that kids need training. All right? That's the first thing. Kids need training. Now, I want you to take your Bible and go to Proverbs 22, chapter 22. Let's all turn over there, Proverbs chapter 22, and let's look at verse number 6, Proverbs 22, verse number 6. What's the very first word in verse 6? Train. Say it again. Train. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. Now... Training is a word we use a lot today, right? Some of you may have a job title with the word trainer in it. Um, people go through all kinds of training today. Some of you right now might be going through training for a new job. Uh, you know, Some of you in here, you train other people to do something. Some people train other people to do a sport, a trade, a job. Uh, today, people hire trainers to train their pets. You know? And so that's a concept that we're familiar with. As parents... We are trainers. Well, that makes sense. That's part of our job description as parents. Train up a child in the way. So the word training indicates a plan, right? I'm training. I got a plan. Uh, it, it indicates an active, positive goal. That makes sense too, right? Imagine you hire a trainer 
right, that is going to come and help you work out and lose weight. Okay, so the first day the trainer shows up and the trainer looks at you and says, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? You, you go, excuse me? And they look at you and say, the trainer says, what do you want to do? And you say, wait a minute. Aren't you supposed to know what to do? <laughs> you're, you're the trainer. You're supposed to be telling me what to do. Well, guess what, parents? You're the trainer. Not the other way around. Does it ever feel like that sometimes kids are training parents in the way they want them to go? <laughs> you know, that, it shouldn't be that way. You know, it's like the other day we had Connor and Landon, my two grandsons, and Connor's two. And he's up at the playground over here. We're, ba we're babysitting him, and he's up at the playground. He's at the very top at the net, you know, and he's looking down at us, and he's waving. I said, way to go, sweet baby, way to go. He looked down at me and went, I can <laughs> When I called him sweet baby, he thought I didn't know his name, you know. So he corrected me. He was training me in how to say his name, right? Every time I call him sweet baby, he goes, I can't. <laughs> He's only two. He's training me, amen? <laughs> but as trainers, listen, parents, as trainers, God wants Christian parents to be proactive, not reactive. You've got to have a plan. In verse 26, he says, uh, talks about training them in the way they should go. That, that phrase, the way, means a course of life, a road. So the idea is we're proactively training our children to follow a definite course. Okay, well, hold on. Then that would lead us to ask some, some logical questions. If I'm training my child to take a definite course, then that would lead me to ask questions like, what values do I want my children to possess? That's a good question. I think every parent should talk about that, think about that. I think if it's a husband or wife, they ought to discuss that. If I said, what are the top five values you want your kids to have? You should be able to tell me that, right? Um, you know, I, I think that we would ask questions like, okay, what kind of worldview do I want my child to have? Because they're going to have a worldview. What kind of worldview do you want them to have? Um, how do you want them to treat people? What kind of spouse do you want them to be one day? What kind of a relationship do you want your kids to have with God? Um, what do you, how do you want your kids to treat Jesus Christ? Well, I think that as believers, our, our plan and our training then should be a little bit more than just, well, I just want my kids to grow up and be good. All right, that's vague and that's really relative, right? That's a little subjective. It's like what's good to one person isn't good to another. So I would think that if we are parents that love the Lord, then we would want our children to be godly, right? We want them to love Jesus. We want our kids to uh, be like Christ, to endeavor to be like Christ, to desire to walk in, in His will for their life. That's the goal. And as parents, our training should involve encouraging them, helping them to follow that godly course that you want them to take. And having said that, it's impossible, hear me now, it's impossible to ensure that your kids are going to, in fact, follow that course when they become an adult. As they say, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Some of you have tried to, have you ever tried to make a horse drink water? No. no. Though, and by the way, those of you who do training at work, you know that, right? You can train somebody in how to do something, but it doesn't mean they're going to do it that way when you aren't looking. It doesn't mean they're going to do it that way when you aren't around. So you say, well, what about the end of verse 6? It says, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. I think what that means is that they're not going to be able to get away from the training they received. It's always going to be part of their mind and their heart. The mind's a computer. There's no delete button. So your kids are never going to be able to depart from the training that they received. doesn't mean they're always going to act on it. Does, you know, they have a free will to make choices. So as a parent... You do the best you can. You do the best you can to train them in the right path as revealed by God in His Word. All right, that's the first thing. Number one is what? Train. You guys are with me. 
I hope people online are responding to you that way, and that's great. All right, number one, we said kids need training. All right, let's look at number two. The second thing that the Bible teaches that kids need is correction. That's the second thing, correction. Look at Proverbs 22 again. We're already there. Look at verse 15. Look down at verse 15. It says that foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. Now, according to the Bible, there's something within every child's heart that a parent needs to reach and drive out, and that is foolishness. And that carries the idea of stubbornness, self-will, disobedience. Can I just say this to you? There are simply no perfect kids. Amen. And by the way, we weren't perfect either, were we? Have you noticed there's something in kids that bends towards doing wrong? Have you noticed that? Like, they don't have to be very old at all before they'll lie to get out of trouble. Did you hit your brother? No. You know just as well as anything they hit him, right? You saw him hit him. Did you hit your brother? No. I didn't hit him. I was just stretching. You know, there's something in kids. Right? In their own little way. They can throw a tantrum. Um, you know, you know, being, being stingy with their toys. That's my toy! Right? There's just something in kids that, that are bent that way. So as a parent, what do we do about this foolishness when we see it surface? Well, I mean, we have choices, right? We can ignore it. We can yell and get real mad. We can excuse it. We can laugh at it, but then there's one more option. We can correct it. When we see that foolishness surface, we can correct it. When it talks about the rod of correction will drive away the foolishness, I want to talk about that a minute. Because I, I, as I was studying this, I kind of got some thoughts there that I've never really seen before. When the Bible talks about the rod of correction... That doesn't necessarily mean corporal punishment with a literal rod or stick. Now, I know some people believe totally in corporal punishment, and then I know other people who are dead set against it in any form. I've seen good parents, all right, both ways on that. Good parents, you know, people that love God both ways. I really don't want to argue that issue. What I want to do is bring this out. The word rod... When it says the rod of correction, that word rod can mean a literal rod or stick. But did you know that Hebrew word that's translated rod there? It's used 190 times in the Old Testament. And did you know most of the time that word is translated not rod or stick? Most of the times the translators translated that Hebrew word tribe. Interesting. It's the idea of a tribal family, a family unit. So I, I think the idea God's trying to get across here is that part of being in a family, and this is in your handout, by the way, part of being in a family, it means that unacceptable behavior is dealt with. It's not overlooked or excused. It's corrected. See, there's some built-in accountability, supposed to be, within a family. And the Bible teaches that parents need to bring correction to their kids. Now, it needs to be done prayerfully, lovingly, consistently, with the parent in total control, but it needs to be done. Let me tell you something, I, and, and I mean this with all my heart, okay? There are too many kids being raised today without any correction whatsoever. And they're not getting corrected. And that, that does not create a good home environment, nor does it create a good human being, all right, when they're never corrected. 
Now, how that correction happens depends on a lot of factors. It depends on the parent. It depends on the personality of the child. It, you know, it, it's funny. You can have two kids, right? You're, you, you and your wife can have two kids. They're in the same family, same upbringing. And, and you can use one form of correction with this child, and it doesn't work at all for this child. And yet this child, you know, responds better to this. So it depends on the person, depends on the age of the child. You're not going to correct a three-year-old like a 12-year-old. You're not going to correct them the same way, right? Um, it depends on the level of the offense that needs correction. I always came down a lot harder on things like lying than I did just foolishness, you know, just, just kind of just things that these kids do, right? Just the tomfoolery that kids get into. I would come on down a lot harder if I knew, if I absolutely knew my child was just out and out lying to me. I would deal with that a lot more severely than maybe something else because that was, again, was one of those core values I wanted to try to get my kids is to be honest, right? And so the level of the offense. But here's the point. Kids need boundaries. Proverbs 1.8 says, My son, hear the instruction of your father. Do not forsake the teaching of your mother. And so the idea is, is that mom and dad are setting up boundaries, and the kids know that there's consequences when they cross those boundaries. You know what that does? That imparts wisdom to them. And it's like, it's like, you know, for a two, three, four, five-year-old, guess what? They are not going to just run into the street. That is a boundary, right? You are not going to let them just run into the street. By the way, is that a good boundary? It's a real good boundary. And if, if they're heading into the street and you holler, and you holler, stop, what should they do? Stop. Have you ever seen a kid just keep running? And not act like they can't even hear a voice behind them? Like there's not even there? Listen, correcting your children and teaching them to obey and bringing and setting up boundaries and making them stay in the boundaries, that may save their life one day. It's important. If you correct your child, does that ensure that your child will grow up to be a model citizen and a godly Christ follower? But it does mean that they'll learn the concept of respect. And it does mean they'll have a better chance to model the training that you've given to them while growing up. So as parents, we said, number one, what do kids need? What was the first? Come on, talk to me. What do kids need? So you train them in the way you train them the way they ought to go. And when they veer off, what do you do? You bring number two. What? Correction. You, bring, you want to bring them back on the road. That's going to be a good road for them. So training and then correction to bring them back where they need to be. But then the final thing is this. Number three is that kids need influence from their parents, which, which I put time in parentheses because you can't have influence without, without ample amounts of time, put, putting time in their life. Um, go to Proverbs 31. Go to chapter 31. All right, Proverbs chapter 31. Look at verse number one. This is interesting. It says the key, the words of King Lemuel, and then look at this, an oracle that his mother taught him. Well, man, that's amazing. Proverbs 31 is an amazing chapter. You know, you guys have heard of the Proverbs 31 woman, the virtuous woman. That's in this chapter. Proverbs 31 is amazing. And the Bible says this king learned it from his mom. This stuff his mom taught him. So obviously his mom had some great influence in his life. Now look, let's just face it, and let's just be honest, parents. There are going to be many influences in your child's life. All right, friends are going to influence your kid. I'm sorry, but they are. Friends are going to influence them. That's why, by the way, you take it or leave it, but you need to know who your kid's friends are. Because how many times have you ever heard this? Boy, he, he got in with the wrong crowd. She got mixed up with the wrong crowd. I didn't even know. Bill Schultz said that when he was a policeman in, in Port Orange, he can't. He said, "I can't tell you how many runaway kids there were." And I would go to the parents and say, "Okay, first thing, who are their friends?" Parents, I don't know. 
I don't, he said, you, you wouldn't believe how many parents had no clue who their kids' friends were. Friends are going to be an influence on your child. There's other influences. Teachers, coaches, uh, youth leaders, hopefully, pastors. Uh, but in your handout, it says parents should be the primary source of influence. They say they say the first five years of a kid's life is crucial. Barnum Research said this: more often than not, what a person decides about truth, sin, forgiveness, and eternal consequences during the preteen years is the same perspective that that person will carry with them to the grave most of the time. Barnum Research also said this: they found that the moral foundations of children are generally determined by the time they reach nine, nine years old. By age nine, most children have their spiritual moorings in place. They said by age 13, your spiritual identity is largely set in place. Now, of course, Christ can get in there and change that, but that's typical, okay? So Christian parent, let's talk for a second. There's going to be forces and influences competing with you. You know how you've got this training you're giving them? There's going to be forces and influences that are going to go against your training. Um, and they're going to try to influence your child away from God, away from the Bible. Look at chapter 19 real quick. Go back to Proverbs 19. Let's flip back there. Proverbs chapter 19. And look at verse number 26 and 27. Very insightful. Proverbs 19, 26 and 27. All right, look at it with me. It says, he who mistreats his father and chases away his mother is a son who causes shame and brings reproach. And then he addresses the child. He says, cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causes to err from the words of knowledge. He says, listen, son. He says, listen. He, he addresses the son. He's like, stop Listening to instruction that causes you to err from the words of knowledge. So there's going to be, my point is, there's going to be competing influences in your child's life. And so our job as parents is to provide godly influence and instruction for our children. For you to be that primary influence, it's going to take T-I-M-E. What does that spell? Time. Time. There's just no way around it. There's just no way around it. I, I know life gets busy. I know life gets crazy. But your kids need you as an active part of their life every day. There's going to be a lot of voices in their ears. But, you know, a lot of voices chirping away in their ear. They're going to have friends chirping away, teachers chirping away. They're going to see stuff online chirping away. They're going to read books chirping away. You want to be that primary voice in their ear. And I want to, I just kind of want to reiterate what I said in the introduction. There are no guarantees when it comes to raising kids. There just isn't. Sorry, there isn't. Some of the greatest men of God in the Bible that just loved God had kids that didn't love God. King David was a man after God's own heart. He loved God so much. Was he perfect? No, but man, he loved God. Other than Solomon, none of David's kids loved God. You know, Samuel was a really godly man. The Bible really doesn't have one bad thing to say about Samuel. He was just a really godly man that just loved God. His kids didn't love God at all. So there's no guarantees. Um, you know, there was a... It's interesting when you look back at the kings, you know, most of the kings were not very good. Some of the kings were very good. There were some godly kings of Israel. Um, and what was interesting, though, is that... Um, some of the godly kings in Israel, when they died, their kids would take the throne, and then they would literally undo all the good 
that their dad did. Like Hezekiah, the Bible says that Hezekiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he trusted in the Lord God of Israel. <laughs> I love that. It says he trusted in the Lord God. This guy was so passionate. Hezekiah led all these reforms because they were, I mean, Israel was, it was terrible. The culture was horrible. You name it, they were doing it. It was evil and ungodly. Hezekiah comes in, cleans house. He tears down all the high places where all the idol worship was happening. And Hezekiah was a great man who loved God. His son comes after him, Manasseh. And Manasseh, the Bible says, did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations. And the Bible even says that Manasseh went back and he rebuilt the high places that Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed. He actually went and rebuilt idolatrous places that his dad had tore down. And what's interesting about that is near the end of Manasseh's life, because he was humble, God humbled him, is Manasseh turned back to God at the end of his life. But it was too late for his son, Amon. Amon had already been corrupted. So when Manasseh died, Amon takes the throne, wicked. And he only lived a couple years. And then Manasseh's grandson took the throne. Manasseh's grandson was Josiah. He also was one of the greatest kings ever. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. What's interesting, Manasseh, when he died, Josiah would have been about five. So, and Josiah took the throne when he was eight years old. So Josiah would have been influenced to see Manasseh's turnaround in his life of turning back to God when he was like four or five years old. And Josiah went on to become an amazing king. My point is this, is that when a person becomes an adult, they have to choose the way they're going to take. They have to choose the path they're going to follow. And, you know, I have seen parents who were really strong in training, really strong in influence. They spent time with their kids. They were kind of weak over here in correction, but their kids turned out great. I've seen parents who were very strong in correction. They corrected. They, they had influence. They spent time with their kids. They were kind of weak in training, but their kids turned out great. I've seen parents who were strong in all three areas. I mean, they proactively trained their kids in the right way. They corrected them pretty consistently, spent ample amounts of time with them. The kids still rebelled. They went down the wrong path. The kids kind of just self-destructed. There's a principle that's found in the Bible that teaches every person is responsible for their own choices. Um, it's in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Ezekiel 18, 20, it says, listen to this. The son shall not bear the punishment of the iniquity of the father, nor shall the father bear the punishment of the iniquity of the son. Romans 14, 12 in the New Testament says, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So let me reiterate, there are no perfect parents. Listen, we are all flawed. We are all flawed. Listen, the older I get, the more flawed I see that I am. How anybody in here like that? It's like the older you get, the more flawed you realize you're. You think you got it all together when you're in your 20s or 30s, right? And then it's like the older you get, it's like, wow. I don't have it together at all, you know? And it's like, here's the deal. Here, here's the deal. We're all so flawed, and we've all got our own baggage, and we've all got our own issues, and we've all got our own sins that we're battling. We've all got past stuff that we're trying to assimilate and digest. And, and here's the deal. We're trying to deal with all that while trying to raise these kids. And we're flawed, and we've got our own baggage, our own issues, our own sins, and we're trying to raise up kids at the same time. So what do you do? You do the best you can, amen? <laughs> you do the best you can. And in your handout it says, ultimately, you have to leave it with God. Amen, church? Amen. you got to leave it with God. You know, this. trust me, this message is not a formula for assured success in parenting. It's just simply some biblical principles 
that will help us to provide what kids really need. Look up here real quick, and let's review. We said, number one, kids need what? Training. Training. Someone's got to train them and teach them the right way to go. Number two, they need what? Correction. Correction. When they veer off course, correction. Bring them back where they need to be. That can be very hard sometimes, but they need correction. Number three? Influence. Influence. Time. That you got to spend time with them, right? So parents, be encouraged. Listen, stay after it. <laughs> See God. Listen, if you got days where you think you're going to pull your hair out, don't do it because it won't help and you will not look good with big clumps of hair missing from your head, all right? So don't pull your hair out, all right? Just pray, seek God, give your kids a good foundation, do the best you can to provide these three things, and ultimately, you're going to have to leave it with God. Amen, church? So I hope it's an encouragement to you. Let's go to him in prayer right now. With our heads bowed and with our eyes closed. You know, as you look at your own life, there may have been some of that lacking as you were brought up. Maybe you didn't receive good training. Your parents were kind of absentee. They weren't there a lot. They didn't spend much time with you. And maybe, maybe you didn't get much correction. So therefore, you made a lot of bad choices. Well, that kind of helps you to see, though, why. You know, and, and now you can correct that in your own life. Christ can bring that correction. Christ can help you. Christ can bring you where you need to be. So this morning, let's, let's submit ourselves to him. Let's yield ourselves to Christ. And, you know, trust me, you, you do like Hezekiah. Do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. Just try to do the right thing. And it will have an impact. You will have great influence. Father, we love you, God, and thank you for your word today. God, we pray that you will bless now, God, as we've studied the word of God. And Lord, you've taught us that our kids need training, they need correction, they need influence, or they need time. And so God, help us as parents. Lord, we need your help because we are flawed. We're so imperfect. And none of us in here have it all together. Lord, we're all a work in progress, and we all got things in our life we're battling. But, Lord, help us, Lord, to just try to be good parents, godly parents for our kids. We know they need that, and we just want to love them. We want to love them fervently. And, Lord, I know some people today may be thinking, wow, he didn't mention love. But, Lord, when we give our kids training and when we give them time, and when we give them correction, that, that's the biggest way we show we love them. That demonstrates. Love is action. And we demonstrate our love for our kids when we give them these things. So God, help us to love them. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
thank you for your word, Lord, for what we've studied today. Lord, now send us out to be your hands and feet, to be your salt and light. Lord, we want to share love with this community. Lord, you've just bestowed on us such a great, such a great love that, Lord, we should be willing to share that with others. So help us to look beyond ourselves to the needs of other people, to share love, to share light, to be your people and your children, to live on your mission, to live for your purposes. God, may your spirit lead us everywhere we go, and may we, in everything we do, may we bring you honor and you glory. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless, church. Thanks for coming.